Hello, you're watching Studio Ken. Make sure you don't miss any episode of Studio Ken by subscribing to the YouTube channel. To subscribe, search for Studio Ken on YouTube, click subscribe on the bottom right of your screen and set a reminder. You can also watch Studio Ken on Diamond TV on Wednesday at 18.30 and on Saturday at 19 hours. Studio Ken, the home of Kennedy Gondway on YouTube. Cancer has not been kind or merciful to the family of Zambia's fourth Republican president, Rupia Bwezani Banda. It claimed the life of his first wife, Hope Mwansamakulu Banda, and attacked his second wife, Madame Tandiwe, with a vengeance. Now, he is having to cope with colon cancer at the ripe old age of 83. His Excellency, Rupia Banda, or R.B., as he is fondly called, is my guest on Studio Ken today. He should have been resting even as we speak, but he has graciously agreed to this interview as a public service to the Zambian people. If you're looking for exclusive and exciting interviews, well, you've come to the right place. But do not forget to hit the subscribe button for you to subscribe to Studio Ken for those interesting insights and, of course, those one-on-ones -on -ones and very, very exclusive content. So hit the like button, do the right thing, and subscribe as well. Thank you, sir, for, for hosting us. Yes, yeah. thank you. How's life been? Okay, thank you very much, especially after I disclosed to the country and to the world that I was not feeling well, that I were, I've been diagnosed with the cancer of the colon. Life has been very hectic because people have responded overwhelmingly in sympathy with me and my family. And how is the Banda family dealing <clears throat> emotionally, psychologically, mentally, given the fact that this is a third time in their lives yes. that they are having to encounter cancer? Right. Yeah, the question says, uh, given that this is the third time, yes, is the third time the direct uh, family that affects me as Rupia Banda. But we have had a lot of problems with the cancer in the family. My father, well, I lost my father to cancer of the throat and uh, many other members of the family, brothers, children, and things like that. But in my direct family, it's been very difficult because I lost my first wife, uh, Hope, uh, Hope Mwansabanda, uh, to cancer. We did everything we could. We took her to America and everything, it didn't work. She passed on. And then I remarried my young wife, and after we had our twins, she was diagnosed with cancer of the breast. And so fortunately, uh, looks like science has developed now to the point where they were able to help us. She survived. And she is on my right hand all the time, encouraging me that yeah, I did it, you can do it too. And so on. But generally, my family is very shaken by by my situation, I'm the head of the family, I'm the oldest member of the family, and uh, then also I have a bigger family, Zambia. Most of the Zambian people, I was very touched. Many times when they called to pray with me on the phone, I just cried because I didn't realize how wonderful uh, human Zambians uh, people generally, but especially here in Zambia, regardless of whatever differences we may have, be it race, be it language, be it tribe, be it political party, everyone. And as I said earlier in an interview with the NBC, uh, the first person that reacted was the president himself, made a long statement uh, in support and prayer for, for me. And they immediately after that, I got a call from the leader of the UPND, uh, popularly known as HH. I've received calls from every leader uh, of political party in this country. And then many friends in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in America. I was talking to the son, to Martin Luther King, the other night. He had heard about my condition and many other friends in Kenya, in Malawi, and everywhere. So that, in a way, has made it a little bit lighter for us. We felt that at least uh, 
there are many people praying for us and wishing me well. Given your advanced age, what exactly goes on in your mind on yes. an everyday basis and yes. the experience that you've had in the family? Yes, no, it's very worrying, of course, you know, cancer, when you hear the word cancer, as uh, you know, people immediately you think the next word is death. So I think about that too. But even with my old age, I've been thinking about death. Because at the age of 83, I know many of my friends, my age mates, who are gone. So I was none. But I also do say to myself that I'm a very fortunate person. I think that God loves me. I don't know why, but that's why I also try to transmit this love that I get from Him to the other people because. 83 years is a, a long time, and my health is generally good. It's just this cancer problem, which has been nagging and bothering me for the last few few years. I didn't really know what it was. But to tell you the truth, I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic that we'll overcome. Yes. I've heard stories on how um, the treatment for cancer, how harsh it is, the chemotherapy. Very, how are you coping on a personal level? Yes, very tough. You know, it's a, a two-weekly cycle. I have to receive 12 chemos. I was diagnosed uh, at the main hospital in, in Dubai where I went with this cancer and they said they'll give me 12 uh, physio, uh, chemotherapies. So what is happening now is that every two weeks I have to go back into the hospital and get chemotherapy. What happens is that on Wednesday I get the chemo. You can see my skin is there, all affected, turn dark, blood problems. So on Monday, which is today, the doctors are coming to get my blood and then they send it to the other doctors and to South Africa. But tomorrow, by tomorrow they know the condition of my blood. On Wednesday I go in at 8 o'clock to the hospital, at the hospital with Dr. Desai, where he is being supported by doctors from UTH, the head of the oncology in Zambia, uh, Dr. Banda and other doctors, Ms. Anide and so on, I think three or four doctors from the Ministry of Health, plus nurses, uh, there are three young Zambian nurses who have trained here in Zambia and in South Africa and Pretoria and in, in Cape Town, they all come to help. So I am getting the best that the country can offer. And then I realize that this is special just for me and that's why it's so painful because if I can suffer like this, what about the other? ordinary people. So what happens is that on Monday they get my blood, on Tuesday they get the results, on Wednesday I go in. And when I get it, the day of the chemo, it's quite traumatic because blood, taking blood from your hand and all kinds of contraptions. And then I get various chemos, I don't get only one. The main one is 46 hours come dropping into my blood from the the container that carries the, the chemotherapy, which I carry like, like uh, over my neck and stay with it on my body. But I get other chemos uh, while there from nine o'clock until about five in the evening, different types of chemo. So you become a little nauseous. So they give you medicine for it to help it a little bit, but it's very painful. And then by five o'clock in the evening on Wednesday, I get the big chemo, then they release me to come home with I carry it on my body and it drops in my body for 46 hours. So during that time it's very difficult. And then that means until Saturday, from Wednesday to early Saturday, and then they come and take it off. And then I can't walk, I'm very weak and I can't eat properly and so on. So Sunday, Monday. By Tuesday, I start my exercises to prepare again for the next week, the following week. So I walk here on my farm. My bodyguards, who are like my nurses now, they walk with me, they help me stretch and so on. Again, the cycle goes on. 
So I'm, right now I'm feeling uh, on top of the world. I'm feeling much better. But I know that in two days' time I'm going to be down again and knock you down. It's painful, but you have to go through it if, if there's any chance of survival. That's quite a lot to deal with. Other people complain of other side effects like loss of hair, nausea, like you're explaining. You can see, I've lost mine. Not only that, also you get skin problems. You can see my face is all affected all over my body, like rash and so on. But hey, nowadays they have antidotes for this. They, they're giving you some little medicine to help and ointments all over my body. Have the doctors indicated to you at what stage you are? Yes, I, mine was at the fourth stage when, they, when I, they discovered it. It was very advanced. Yes. Now, you um, discovered quite late, for a person like you who's yes. got access to first class mm -hmm. medical treatment. Yes. Um, when we heard that you actually had colon cancer, it took yes. us by surprise. Yes. Why did it take so long? Because we didn't really know that we had colon cancer. We, some years ago, because I go every six months, the government sends me overseas. Normally I go to South Africa. I go to Pretoria to Sid African Hospital, where the doctors will know my body and all that. I always go there. We thought that we had problems with my hip and my legs and all this sort of thing. But actually there were some problems. First the prostate, there were some prostate problems. And then they discovered it. And they were able to give us treatment without uh, chemo and all this sort of thing. They were able to suppress it. But recently, the last six months, just before the corona, before we closed our countries, South Africa closed the country, and I, was, I was in South Africa for treatment. They started to see funny things in my, in my body, particularly in my internal organs. So the doctors there said, listen, uh, we don't want to rush. Go back for three months and let's see what happens. They took blood and everything. So when we got here, I got very sick. So my doctor took me to his hospital and some young doctors from UTH, they came they, and they started to suspect that I have cancer. Yeah, the, the cancer was somewhere in my organs, or in, in the intestines. But then it got worse. So we went to the hospital, this new hospital here, uh, we have the equipment, and they took blood and everything, and sent it abroad. Within two days they came back and said, colon. That's when we really found. But they, all along there had been suspicion that there's something wrong with me. You know what it was. How did you take it? Of course, you get scared when you hear something like this. Yes, but you know, like I told you, my wife is a survivor. So she has always been saying to me, "Look, I got it," and I went through it. You were on my side. Now I'm on your side, and I'm telling you that you can do it. Listen to what the doctors are saying, and be careful what you eat, and so on, so on. Don't stress yourself. If I offend you, forgive me. And so, so, so I, I'm very fortunate. I have a lot of support. My sisters, my brother James, my children. They, 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 the ones who are really shaken. If you take people like Henry Nenani and Dingani, their mother passed on because of this. But. And the twins? Yeah, the twins, that's why I worry about my twins because they are young. They're only 16 now, but um, every day they call me and say, Daddy, you'll be okay. And I believe that that's a prayer. They are there encouraging them. Their school also encourages them. Their friends at school pray with them and encourage them. Yeah. So what are some of the foods that you've had to um, get rid of as part of your recovery process? Yes. The one I remember the most, as soon as you ask the question, is the one I like the most, which is beef. <laughs> is beef. You know, I'm half Ngoni and I love my beef. I like to roast meat and so on. That one, you know, I still eat. They haven't said I should not <clears throat> eat beef, but I eat very sparingly. <clears throat> I concentrate now on um, 
the chicken, fish, and vegetables. Yes. Before Zambia had its own hospital dedicated yes. or devoted to cancer treatment, yes. the country used to spend as much as $10,000 on treating one person one abroad person. Yes. without even including yes. the aid tickets. Yes. As someone who served at the very high level uh, as president, yes. what do you think can be done in order to help mm. uh, every person that may have yes. cancer, yes. regardless of their status yes. in society? It is that statistic that you gave that made me decide to set up the cancer center here. I, am, I wasn't sitting, I did realize that I would end up being the beneficiary of it, you know, when you are well and so on, you don't think that one day you will be in the same situation as other Zambians or other people have gone through. But it was obvious from that statistic alone that uh, the government could not afford that. So the first decision we made when I became president was to set up the cancer center. We sat down with the doctors, with the permanent sector, I remember uh, Peter. Uh, Mwaba? Yes. Dr. Mwaba, yes, and of course I remember he was my permanent secretary, but he was in charge of the hospital at UTS. And uh, my minister of, of health, both Chituo as well as the other, you remember the gentleman, I've forgotten his name. Uh, we all sat down as the cabinet and said we have to set up a cancer center, which we did. I actually sent my ministers, including my doctor, who was then my advisor at State House. We sent them to China, we sent them to Japan to talk to people there and help us to set up this, uh, you get the equipment and so on. But you know, it's one thing to set up a cancer center and another to sustain it and another to have adequate equipment and another to have adequate medications. That is the biggest problem. Cancer requires a lot of medication and very expensive medication. And uh, that is where we are facing problems. And with the problems that most of our economies are facing in Africa and in the world now, because I'm saying in the world, because we have to get help from outside as well. But even those countries have got their own problems with Corona and so forth. So it's very difficult right now for the ordinary people, ordinary Zambians, especially in the rural areas, who don't even have a little clinic and things like that. It's very painful, I'm sure, the way I feel, and the way every leader in Zambia should be feeling. Yeah. You're right when you talk about it being one thing to set up a hospital like yes, that. Yes. Because most of the people that you meet at the Cancer Diseases Hospital complain about the lack of uh, medicine. Yes. Some of the medicine, as you are experiencing it yourself, yes. has to yes. be imported, actually. Yes. What can be done to bridge the gap? Yes. First of all, you know, really, we, it's a serious problem. Very serious problem. Not, and, and cancer is just one disease. And by the way, that's why, despite the fact that I'm tired and they don't take interviews anymore, but for this one, after you requested me to participate, I felt that I have to, I have to join uh, uh, fellow Zambians who have gone through this and who are fighting to bring this to the attention of, uh, of uh, uh, everybody that uh, it's a serious problem and we need help. Uh, we need help and I'm hoping that uh, uh, this corona virus issue will be over so that the world can go back to where it was before, where we can help each other. You remember when AIDS struck the world, and so we're fortunate, the United States of America pumped in a lot of money into Zambia to assist us, and they've continued to do so. Uh, this is an area in which I would call upon all our friends, our collaborating partners all over the world to realize that we need, we need help. And then for our leaders also to realize that it's a big problem. There are many people are just suffering and dying without any, any help. So that's why I, I, I accepted this interview. Thank so you. that it can be used to bring the attention 
of our leaders, we have to find money somehow. If I can be of any help to the government to talk to other governments, to talk to other leaders, to help us, I will gladly do that. I told you that, uh, or I mentioned to you when we were preparing this interview, that the other night I was talking to, to some leaders in the United States, um, in particular the son to Martin Luther King, who visited Zambia last year, and I met him for the first time, although I knew his father and I knew his sister who runs the Martin Luther King Foundation in, <coughs> in Atlanta. I didn't know him, but when he came here, he was sent here for some purpose, I think, to, by the United States government. I met him, we became like good friends. He phoned me when he heard that I was in this problem. And I say to him that, look, I'm hoping that your political party will win because he has influence there, and that you will come and visit us here in Zambia with a group of black American leaders, mayors, politicians, businessmen. I'm sure that my president will gladly uh, receive them together with me. And perhaps we can find a way to, to raise private money or pri private interest in what we're trying to do. The specifically, to your question, what can we do? I think we should try and make some of our own medicines here. We should, we should. I know for sure that there is, for instance, I know that there is a, a, a Chinese company who wants to set up a, a pharmaceutical company here to make medicine. Because as you know, cancer, it's not just cancer medicine. You need medicine for painkillers and all this sort of, I think we should go that way as well. That's, Let's industrialize and have our own factories. If there are people who are willing to set up factories here without us having to put money up and they will do it and get their money from us as we buy the medicines, I think that would be a good idea. The public health burden of cancer in Zambia is quite huge. Uh, statistically huge. speaking, there are over 3,000 cases that yes. are recorded every year. In fact, yes. in the last Five years. And in and Zambia, when you say recorded, it means that they have two times, three times the figure you're talking about. Precisely yes. the point. And therein lies the problem. There are people that have suggested and have heard it from you that yes. it's important for the government to probably work with the private sector yes. in terms of reducing yes. that burden. Yes. What is your take on that? Yes, you know, it's a mentality of the Zambians. It comes from our history. In 1964, after we got our independence and so on and so on, we immediately, because, because of colonialism and because of the, the, the neglect that we had during the colonial time, the government found itself obliged to get involved in the, uh, in the building up of the economy. And I think it was a good decision. That's why the index was of this world, is Zimco and all these were set up and so on. But then it became a mentality. We don't want uh, to hear about private sector. We, everything want the government to be involved. And I think that's a mistake. Because right now the government has no money to be, get involved, whether they like it or not. But there's a lot of private sector people who want to come here. Not only in, in health, in every sector of our life. In tourism, in whatever. There are people who are willing to come here. But they come across bureaucracy. They come across obstruction and people say, no, you must be dead, you must ask the permanent secretary, you must ask the, the, this the parastato to do this. And it has not work that way. This country is a big country. And it, in order for us to cope with the problem, we have to work together. Anybody who wants to come here, provided we have the correct regulations to ensure that they don't exploit us. Uh, in health in particular, I think that we would do well to change that mentality and immediately do that, which we have done in a way. There are a lot of private hospitals coming in now. The way they discovered my colon, was a private hospital, they had equipment there which we don't have in the government hospital. So that means that that's the route we should go. Yes. Earlier on, you spoke about uh, your chemotherapy regime, yeah. what you do on a yes. weekly basis. But people also know your other passions, football, yes. farming. How much yes. of that has suffered? Well, you know, I don't have the energy anymore to go there, but 
I still, the other night I was watching football on my screen here. I watched the game between the, uh, the, the two Spanish teams. The, yeah, classical. Uh, yeah, classical. I watched, I watched that game, then after that I watched the English. I still I love football very much. And I'm so happy to see that uh, from the grassroots level of our football, we're improving. I just read this morning that we've beaten Ethiopia twice now. Ethiopia is a big team. And, and without any professionals, just our young players uh, from local clubs here. And then now also, unlike before, we have so many young Zambians who are going abroad. The, other, the same night I watched Zulu, I think, he's playing Cape Town, was playing his first game in Cape Town. He went to Cape Town last week. And uh, so I saw him playing uh, in the thing and he, I could see it was his first game that we have a good future there. And then, of course, we've got our boys in Europe. Uh, there's still a lot uh, of talent in this country. As a person who holds uh, Zambian football close to his heart, you yeah. are chairman of uh, Chiparamba Great Eagles Football Academy that yes. contributed quite a number of players to yes, the national yes, team. Yes. You are former chairman of the Fans Association. Yes. What do you think can be done? Also, I'm sure you've forgotten that uh, I used to be the first Vice President of FAS. Yes, the When Mr. Mtina was the President of FAS, he had two Vice uh, Chairmen. The first Vice President, which was myself, the second was uh, Sakala, mm -hmm. our lawyer from Ndola. So I've worked very hard. We saw the, uh, the first crop of Zambians to go abroad. Galushawari uh, went to Sekul Bruce, and Charles Msonda, and all this. And so on, and then of course I was very much involved in the formation of Bola Bola, the, the fans soccer fans so. association. And of course I used to like boxing also. <laughs> Who you would box? <laughs> no, I never boxed anybody. Mm -hmm. But I, I like to see young people, mm -hmm. you know, send people like <clears throat> Mwale and so on abroad, traveled with him to the United States for the World Championship. I was very much interested in sports, and it turned out that my children too are very much interested. As you know, Nenani, a very good friend, <clears throat> he, he is the founder of Chiparamba. He asked me to be his chairman. I know why he asked me. He wanted me to buy him the ball <laughs> for the first Chiparamba. Did you do that? Yes, I did. I bought the first three balls for the Chiparamba mm -hmm. Academy, which we started in Karingaringa. Mm -hmm. And I saw it grow. And, so, and now I see a lot of uh, academies coming up. And I see a lot of scouts coming into the country looking for Zambian players. And so on and so on. And I think that we now have a better chance of qualifying for the World Cup than we had before. The foundation seems much deeper now. Yes. Thank you very much for hosting us. One day I'll come back to talk about uh, politics in Zambia yes, with elections yes. coming yeah, up next year. <laughs> I may not allow you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but this mm. cause for which you have dedicated yourself of talking about health issues in our country, particularly cancer, is very important. And I really would call upon everyone to respond positively. We have to find a way together to find a solution. Because, like I said, I'm fortunate I'm a former president. I'm fortunate the president himself is so sympathetic to me and to of Dr. Gaunda, who is also his responsibility. But for the ordinary people, we need to find a formula. And I'm willing to participate. Even with my illness, I'm willing to participate in finding ideas to resolve this. That's why you heard me, I told you, I was talking to Martin Luther King Jr., that uh, if the Democratic Party in the United States win because I know it's very close to them. I would like to see some black leaders come here and say, can't they invest in our health sector? Can they invest in our industry? Can they help us to get out of this problem? Uh, out of these problems which we are facing now. Thank you. 
you're looking for exclusive and exciting interviews, well, you've come to the right place. But do not forget to hit the subscribe button for you to subscribe to Studio Ken for those interesting insights and, of course, those one-on-ones and very, very exclusive content. So hit the like button, do the right thing, and subscribe as well.